Now, there's only been four senior pastors in the 67 years since this is uh, Bob Munger was the starting as the pastor. Just four. That's quite a, a legacy for uh, a church and the faithfulness of the gospel and a testimony of the, of the, of the commitment of these two men, um, Bob Munger and Earl Palmer, uh, Mark Laverton, Harold England. Uh, but to think about it, four, only four pastors in 67 years. That's a great uh, legacy, a great church to be a part of. And we're so grateful that, that Earl's here tonight uh, to think with, with us about this uh, remarkable man, Robert Boyd Munger. I'd like to turn this over now to Dick Stop. I'd like you to welcome Dick and Earl tonight. My name is Dick Staub, and I know you're all really here to see me tonight. Uh, <laughs> Because I attended this church in the late 70s, and at a time in my life when the least likely thing I would have done would have been on a platform advocating the gospel of Jesus Christ, but Earl Palmer was the pastor during that time, had a huge influence on my life. As a matter of fact, uh, I was here this Sunday, the day after Star Wars, the film was released, and her, her girl do this whole thing about Darth Vader and the dark side, and light, and dark, and... And I ended up writing a book later called Christian, Christian Wisdom of the Jedi Masters. Uh, so Earl has had a huge impact on, on my life. Uh, he is Yoda. Uh, so uh, I want to just tell you briefly a little bit about what the Kindling's concept is. Uh, I did a national talk show in Chicago in the, in the uh, 90s. And when we came back to Seattle, uh, we were interested in, in trying to do things at the intersection of faith and culture. And uh, a friend of mine suggested podcasting, and I, I wasn't really sure I wanted to do that. But I was in England, in uh, Oxford, England, uh, when Anthony Flew, the world's leading atheist, revealed that he had just become a theist. And he was asked uh, by Gary Habermas, who was doing the interview, if he'd ever met C.S. Lewis. And Anthony Flew said when he was a student at Oxford, he used to sit as close as he could to the Inklings at the Bird and Baby pub, just to overhear the conversations of the Inklings. And I thought, what a great idea. And so we, we came back and actually started a show in a pub in Seattle, uh, where we basically had a round table discussion of ideas that matter. The difference being we invited the people in the pub into the conversation. And Earl appeared on the show on the fifth anniversary of 9-11. Uh, and the question was, where was God on 9-11? And we had a Muslim imam, we had a Jewish rabbi, and we had Earl uh, representing the Christian faith. And he did such an amazing job, and we had such a good time, and, and uh, he's been such an important mentor. So uh, he later asked if we could do a Kinley's Music at Earl Palmer Ministry. So we now do a show uh, every month in Seattle where we do a show about uh, books every thoughtful Christian ought to read. Uh, and he chooses a book, and you know, you may know he reads. Uh, and so it'll be Carl Bart one time, it'll be, uh, we just did Tim Keller. We, uh, we do really interesting things on the University of Washington campus. And the format of the show is real simple. We'll, we'll start with, uh, I'll introduce Earl. Uh, we'll be bringing music in and out like it's a live show because it's going to be taped and then podcast. Um, after Earl uh, kind of introduces the subject tonight, we'll take a quick break just so you can stretch and use the facilities. Um, then we'll be back for a second uh, segment where I'll just discuss with Earl some of what he's been talking about, ask some of my questions. And then in the third segment, you'll have an opportunity to ask anything you want uh, about tonight's discussion. And, and we'll just have a microphone and you'll just stand up where you are. We usually distribute cards to hand out, but we're, we're not going to do that tonight because it will be just much more informal. <coughs> Uh, if you have a question or something you'd like to ask, we'll take questions and answers in that third segment. Uh, so right before we start the introductory music, uh, I'd like you to welcome Earl Palmer. And uh, <laughs> maybe you can just say something about Earl Palmer Ministries and, and what all you're involved with these days. Well, uh, after I retired uh, from the University of Presbyterian Church, uh, we, uh, a group of, uh, of laymen and women at the uh, University Church said, said why don't we uh, form a, a ministry that would be a little bit like what John Stott had after he retired at All Souls, so you could be sort of a pastor at large. 
And so Earl Palmer Ministries, by the way, they came up with that title. Uh, they, they, let's just call it what it is. So Earl Palmer Ministries was started, and I have a board of directors, and we uh, basically, <laughs> it enabled uh, me to have sort of a, an at-large ministry. And uh, the one big thing we did, though, was together with Dick Staub, we started our Kindling's Muse. And just a little show and tell at, on the back table, uh, you'll see a whole list of all the Kindling's Muses we've done together and the ones that lie ahead in the fall. So you can, uh, you can access them on the website or come uh, physically, be physically present at one of these. Uh, they're marvelous experiences. And that's, that's one thing we, we right away started. And then also, uh, as soon as I retired at University Press, the National Presbyterian Church of Washington, D.C. asked if I would be willing to be a preaching pastor in residence there. And originally just for about four or five months, well, I ended up almost two years on loan from Earl Palmer Ministry to the National Presbyterian Church. Uh, and that's right, did that for about two years, which was great in, in the nation's capital. And uh, apart from that, that's what we're doing. Oh, one other big thing in my life is that and, uh, one of my loves uh, uh, and very important parts of my own history here at Berkeley is New College Berkeley. And so Susan and Sharon uh, keep inviting me every year to come and do a, a one-day biblical exposition time here at, at New College. And we use uh, First Press Berkeley for that. And that's going to happen tomorrow. So originally I was coming down just to do that. And we're doing Second Timothy tomorrow, the uh, Bible study. And then the thought occurred, well, why don't we do a Kindling's Views on uh, this great hero of mine, uh, Robert Boyd Munger? Because last year, uh, Dick and I did a Kindling's Views on John R. W. Stott and his basic Christianity as a kind of a, uh, a Christian hero for our time. And, uh, and then when I was in Washington, D.C., we did a Kindling's Views. He came all the way back to Washington, and we did one on George Washington, America's hero. And American leader, and uh, that was one of our one of our great Kennedy's muses, and he came all the way back for that. So then I I said to Dick, "Are you willing to come all the way to Berkeley from Orange Island, where he lives, to do one on Robert Boyd Munger? And where else to do it but right here at the uh, First Presbyterian Church?" So that's the story, and that's sort of what we're doing, and uh, it's just been a joy. If you could turn off your cell phones, we'd appreciate it. And uh, I'm going to play a 10-second countdown, and then we'll get started with the uh, the live show tape for podcast. And we'll be And now, here's your host, Dick Starr. Thank you. It always uh, strikes me as a little presumptuous to say our show is intelligent and hospitable and imaginable, imaginable right before we do the show, but this is the Kinlick's Muse at Earl Palmer Ministries, and this event is taped for podcast in front of a live audience tonight at the First Presbyterian Church of Berkeley, where a very hearty group of Bay Areas have fought off a big storm uh, to join us tonight. It's really raining out there, and I, I left all this in Seattle, and so did you, and we kind of hope we'd get something different from this, but we're glad to be here. Uh, each month, Reverend Earl Palmer selects a book every thoughtful Christian ought to read. And tonight, in addition to doing a book, we're going to really do a retrospective uh, of the life of the author of the book, uh, My Heart Christ's Home. Uh, that book was written by Reverend Robert Boyd Munger. Uh, it started as a sermon right here in this church in 1947, early in uh, Robert Munger's pastorate. And tonight is therefore kind of a homecoming for those who want to reflect back on Robert Munger's life and ministry. And it's also a wonderful homecoming for Ur Reverend Earl Palmer who uh, served here as pastor as well. So can we have a big round of applause for Earl Palmer?
Well, I wanted, I wanted to do a, a Kinley's Views uh, on, this, uh, on this great man. Uh, in a way, uh, there's, there's several reasons. One, because of the role that Robert Boyd Munger had played in my own life. I came to this school, he graduated from this school, I graduated from this school, University of California. I came in 1949 as a freshman, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, my first two years, I, I didn't particularly go to church or particularly get involved in anything that was uh, in the Christian church, but I did, toward the end of my sophomore year, get involved in a small Bible study group. It was just down the street from here, Barrington Hall. And then through that, was invited to come to the college group here at First Press, and then went to a conference at Lake Tahoe. And that conference had two speakers, Edward John Carnell, who was then at Florida Seminary, and Robert Boyd Munger. And of course, I by now knew that Robert Boyd Munger was the pastor of his church where I was attending. And Dr. Munger posed the issue of Christian faith at that conference in a way that made sense to me. He said, when on the basis of what you know about Jesus Christ, you're willing to trust in his trustworthiness, then you're ready to become a Christian. And I can still remember lying on the dock at, at this Christian camp, uh, uh, Zephyr Point at Lake Tahoe, looking in the water and saying, you know, on the basis of what I've seen in the Bible study group I was with, these guys at Barrington, and now uh, this weekend, on the basis of what I know about Jesus Christ, I'm willing to put my weight down on his trustworthiness. And that was the point where I decided to be a believer in Jesus Christ. And came back to Cal, got active at Cal Berkeley, got active in, in what was then Calvin Club, the college group here. And really from that point on, I'd have to say that uh, this pastor played a very key role. He played that key role in the very beginning of my journey. But also at very fundamental times, uh, he, uh, he's the one that uh, I went to talk to about the thought that maybe I'd like to be a minister. And uh, so from there I went to, to study to be a minister. And then when I was about to graduate from Princeton Seminary after having two summers here as the first summer intern in the history of this church, uh, and fortunately, it didn't destroy the summer internships they had. And but after Should we put that to a vote. <laughs> but after the after the, by uh, graduating at uh, Princeton, it was Robert Boyd Munger who recommended me to L. David Cowie, his close friend in Seattle. So I owe that to him. I got my first job because of this man, and and then uh, I went to that church as a youth pastor. And then when Robert Boyd Munger left uh, Berkeley to come to Seattle as pastor. I served under Robert Boyd Munger as, as a junior colleague. He baptized our first little ch child, Anne, and so that's another marker. And then a strange thing happened. I went to the Union Church of Manila and I came back after four years there. I was going back for two more years in Manila and came and, and Dr. Munger asked me to preach at the university church. And that day, he was sort of shaken because Harold England announced that he was going to uh, leave uh, the Berkeley Church to go on to another post. And Dr. Munger said to me, Earl, you're the man for that church. I said, oh no, I've got to go back to Manila. And so I had to go back for the two more years in Manila. But he, he was right. I ended up as the pastor of this church. And uh, so I guess you'd have to say, right along my whole life, he played such a key role. And, and therefore, I just wanted to, uh, I wanted, I wanted to, to remember him in, in this uh, exciting way tonight, in the, the venue of Kindling News. First of all, who is Robert Boyd Munger? Well, he grew up as a boy here in, in Berkeley. His family was a Christian family. His father was an elder in this church for some 35 years. His sister, Helen, his brother, Maynard, that family all grew up here. He went to Berkeley Public Schools. He graduated from the University of California in 1932. Uh, in his little book, Leading from the Heart, which I love, which is sort of fairly close to being an autobiography of his life, he tells about how faith came together for him. Uh, 
and, and he tells it this way, that uh, in, uh, in, in his uh, college years, he, he knew about the gospel because of his Christian family and because of his church that he attended occasionally, though he uh, really deferred as best he could not to, not to come to church any more than he had to. Uh, and he was active on campus, but in the middle of, at the end of his junior year, he, with a friend of his, who was his best friend, got a job on the Matson Line, where it was a, a, a small 7,000 ton ship, uh, sailing ship, it was sort of a, a joint cargo and passenger ship, and on the way back from Sydney, Australia, and he tells all about this in Leading from the Heart, on the way from Sydney to San Francisco, they had a typhoon. He actually felt he was going to be done in. He began to slip on the deck because he was a young deckhand and he was supposed to be in his rounds. And he, because of the, the water that was going right over the deck, yeah, it caused him to fall. He started to slide. He actually thought he was going to die. He wondered about what his life would really amount to. And at that time, especially the days after that, he had a, an amazing uh, kind of uh, an epiphany experience, and he tells about it in uh, Leading from the Heart. He says this about that experience. He said, uh, in the days following that typhoon, uh, without warning, the truth of Christ, he said, came to me. And that truth was where our Lord says, I am the light of the world. That's John 8. I am the light of the world. He that followeth me will not walk in darkness. And uh, by the way, that text is in the same text that says, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free, which is carved on the wall of Berkeley High School. Uh, he doesn't say that here, but I just have to know that. <laughs> but he said, without warning, the truth of Christ came to me. I am the light of the world. I responded, if you really are light, let me see some of it, and I'll try to follow it. And he said, that was the moment that as far as I can tell, I opened the door of my heart to Christ. I didn't know it, but all along, I had been longing desperately for the light. And that's how he describes it. But that was sort of the moment when he said, if you're the light, show me and I'll follow it. Well, he came back from that, that trip and his family was going to Mount Hermon, which became a big part of his family's history. And his mother and father prevailed upon him to go to Mount Hermon. He didn't really want to go. But he said, all right, I'll go. But I don't want to go to any meetings if we go down there. And so they went down. But fortunately, there were a lot of youth that were there from the Hollywood Presbyterian Church. That's before they owned Forest Home. And Mount, the, the Hollywood Church would bring their college kids to Mount Hermon. And these college kids uh, were really the kids that, that won his respect and he liked them and so he started to go. Uh, at first he didn't want to. He, he, he tried to get one girl to go to a movie and she said, oh gee, I would love to go with you in the movie but I've got a meeting I'm going to tonight with our, with our group. And uh, can we go to the movie after the meeting? A little bit of a really low-key, thoughtful evangelism on that. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, he went to the meeting and fortunately the leader of the Hollywood college group was Henrietta Mears, who would play a very big part in the life of Robert Boyd Munger and a lot of other people's lives, mine as well. We have a room now in this building named after Henrietta Mears. Well, anyway, she was the leader of that group. And at that, at that conference, he went at Victory Circle and took a piece of wood and threw it in the fire. And throwing it in the fire, he said he wanted to follow Jesus Christ. And then he came back. He had just been elected president of his fraternity. And so he, but he kept, he kept quiet in that fraternity, he said for that whole year, about his faith, because Bob Munger is a shy person. He didn't talk a lot that way. And, but nevertheless, he, he was trying to be a Christian in that house. Finally, at the end, they had a national, uh, uh, a national uh, fraternity party or a convention, and he felt that he couldn't be involved in some of the things that they wanted to do at that convention, so he resigned from that. And some of the members of the house were upset about that. And then he graduated from the University of California, 
but as the outgoing president, he was asked to give a word of wisdom. I love this part of leading from the heart. He was asked to give a word of wisdom to the fraternity as he left. And this is how he tells about that word of wisdom. He said he was quaking to come up because he'd never spoken uh, to these uh, guys in any kind of verbal way or public way about his faith. But he said, that night at our chapter meeting, I had the opportunity as an alumnus, he had just graduated, to give a word of wisdom, and of course, outgoing president, he would have that right. I took my time and told them about my struggle to find the meaning in life. I reminded them of my experience at sea and explained how my awareness of God's love and light was becoming more real day by day. I told them I had finally found a friend on whom I could rely. I then said that I felt a tremendous sense of rightness about what I was doing and that I knew for certain God was real and would be with me each step of the way. I did not give much of the gospel, but I did point to Jesus as the living Savior. Uh, I learned a great lesson that night as I stood before my brothers. It's, that, it's this. The most effective preaching often does not come from the pulpit. The best witness for Christ usually comes when one is simply being authentic. It's when we share our hurts, our struggles, our hopes, our lack of faith, our dreams, our unique perspectives, and not to, to those who have arrived spiritually, and not as one who's arrived spiritually, but simply as one who's chosen to follow the light the Savior has provided. And this kind of authentic living is a primary qualification. It's more important than technique. He then makes that reflection on, on what it means to be a Christian leader. Well, the rest is history. Uh, Dr. Munger uh, decided to go into the ministry, and he uh, did two stints in theological schools. Uh, uh, one stint of a, for a year at Moody Bible Institute, and then three marvelous years at Princeton Theological Seminary. Right? And uh, he had great friends in both places. He left Princeton Seminary and started his first job in South Hollywood Presbyterian Church. Once again, in the company and around people that were very influential friends and, uh, uh, and encouragers in his life. But the best thing of all that happened in South Hollywood was that he fell in love with Edie Barton. And Edie, who had been the secretary to the pastor of the Hollywood Presbyterian Church, and she, and so she knew it, it would be like to, to marry a pastor. That's a good thing, because uh, she married uh, Bob Munger. They then, in 1945, came to Berkeley. They raised their two beautiful girls, Monica and Marilyn, who are here tonight. And uh, as I met those girls, too, because on one occasion I lived in their home for a while and realized how wild and exciting those girls were. They were <laughs> wild young girls then. And I was just a seminary student. But uh, uh, they came to Berkeley, and Edie, of course, and, and Bob had this incredible ministry of 17 years here in Berkeley. But one of the most historic moments in his life, and he tells about it in Living, in Leading from the Heart, happened in 1947, early on in his career here at this church, when uh, he uh, was uh, set to give an evening sermon, uh, a service in the evening service. Well now, you know, if you're a Presbyterian minister and you have the morning service, that's the big service. That's when all the important people come. The evening service uh, is, it's always been a downgraded service. Uh, it's been extremely loyal, but people who have nothing else to do, or uh, you know, that kind of people, and, and youth, would come to the evening service. And because of one nice thing about the evening service at First Presence, we turned the cross on and sang, uh, there is a place of quiet rest near the heart of God. And that would be nice at the end of the service. But there wasn't much else about the evening service that was particularly exciting because the pastor would give a sermon that would not be one of the great sermons that's going to be memorable. Well, that night in 1947, he, uh, he says that he didn't know what he was going to preach on that night or teach on because he really saw it as a teaching time. But during the, during the week, he had been studying Ephesians chapter 3, verses uh, 16 through the end of the chapter, which is the great prayer of St. Paul in Ephesians. And the prayer goes like this. It's, it's, one, it's one of my two or three favorite passages in all the Bible. Uh, where Paul says in Ephesians 3, he says, uh, 
For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. It's a prayer. From whom every family in heaven and earth takes its name. And uh, I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened through his spirit. And that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. As you are being rooted and grounded in love. He tells in this uh, leading from the heart that when he read that text, the text that struck him the most was verse 17. And he especially liked the Weymouth translation of verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And Weymouth translated it this way, that Christ may settle down and be at home in your hearts by faith. He said that text, that Christ will dwell in your heart through faith, that's the way the RSV puts it. And Weymouth translated it this way, that he may settle down and be at home in your hearts by faith. And so Dr. Munger, with only a few notes, in a way, told a parable about his own life and what it was like to invite Jesus Christ to be in his life. In fact, he starts that great sermon, My Heart, Christ, Home. He starts it this way, I will never forget the evening I invited Jesus Christ into my heart. What an entrance he made. It was not a spectacular, emotional thing. Bob Munger was not a spectacular, emotional person. You saw it in the fraternity. He said he never, you know what he says in this, he never prayed out loud. And when he was once asked to pray out loud, he had to write the prayer to make sure he didn't misread any word. He was so shocked. And so he says, when I invited Christ, it wasn't a spectacular emotional thing, but very real, occurring at the very center of my soul. He came into the darkness of my heart and turned on the light. Have you noticed how big light plays a role in his life? What happened on the ship was he said, the, the verse that hit him was, I am the light of the world. And he said, I'll follow that light, Lord, if you show me. The light becomes a very important marker in, in Bob Munger's life. So he said, uh, he came into the darkness of my heart and turned on the light. He built a fire in the cold hearth and banished the chill. He started music where there had been stillness and harmony where there had been discord. He filled the emptiness with his own loving fellowship. I have never regretted the opening of the door to Christ, and I never will. That's how he started the sermon. And at that point, he decided to create a parable of his own house, of his own house, life as a house with rooms in it. And I'll let you read it for yourself. It's amazing. By the way, a few weeks ago, I, I was at, when I was in Washington, D.C., three times I was asked to speak at Annapolis to the, to the midshipmen and then to a faculty retreat as well. And a few weeks ago, I was asked to come back and speak to the midshipmen for a retreat. And unknown to me, uh, on, the, on the literature table, uh, the, the chaplain had put out two sets of books. They put out a book by John Stott, and then My Heart, Christ Home. This little, this little book uh, from the sermon that Dr. Mugger gave in 1947. He tells in this book that when he preached it, to his amazement and chagrin, sitting on the back row was Ethel May Baldwin from the Hollywood Church and Henrietta Mears, his hero, were sitting in the back row. And afterward, he was scared to death because he felt like I didn't do a good job in that sermon. I was just telling this sort of parable. And afterward, Miss Mears came up and said, that is a good sermon. I want you to give it at Forest Home this summer. And the rest is history. It was a great sermon. Uh, University Press picked it up and has published over 10 million copies of that sermon, My Heart, Christ Home. Uh, I want to make now three reflections and then, then my part will be over at the beginning and then we'll, Dick and I can talk and then you maybe have things you'd like to say too or questions you'd like. I want to reflect tonight on the enduring greatness of Robert Lloyd Munger as the man and the pastor. We did a little of this with John Stott, didn't we? In fact, there's such a similarity between John Stott and Robert Lloyd Munger. It seems to me there are three key markers 
that help to describe Robert Boyd Munger, and also that are important teaching themes for our lives today. First, he was a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ, and this is the centeredness that meant the most to him. More than anything else, what meant the most to him was when he found the light was Jesus Christ, to have his life centered in Jesus Christ. He always taught that we as believers can have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Does that sentence sound familiar? That's a Robert Boyd Munger sentence. You have the right to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Not just a theoretical understanding, or not just a, an agreement with, the, with themes or theory, but a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And I really believe that's the greatness of this man. It's a centeredness that he had. It protected him from preoccupation with secondary themes. And I could say as a pastor, and a pastor who struggled with these things too, like all pastors do, if I could say one of the things that is the most damaging thing that can happen to ministry for a layperson or a pastor is when we get preoccupied with secondary themes. We see it in the political realms, we see it in, in, in church realms, where themes at the edges, which may have significance, but they're secondary. They get, uh, they have secondary importance. Bob Hunger never really got in track with secondary themes. It's because of that simple and direct sentence. He was a man in Jesus Christ. And it, I, I come back to my own experience of when I was at, for, for, when I was at Lake Tahoe listening as a young inquirer, think of all the things he could have said to encourage or to woo or to uh, convince uh, this young sophomore at University of California, uh, political science major, uh, full of himself, uh, young man uh, who is just inquiring in the faith. Think of all the things he might have done to try to win me. Uh, make it with me by telling me how great the Presbyterian Church is, or win me by how marvelous it would be to be in ministry and change the world, or how wonderful it would be to, to uh, uh, have these uh, particular themes that uh, are uh, politically correct themes or religiously correct themes. Instead, notice what he said, when on the basis of what you know about Jesus Christ, you're willing to trust in His trustworthiness. That's Christian faith. And that's centeredness, total centeredness. And I think it's the greatness of Robert Boyd Mother. Secondly, he had confidence in Christ's ability to be his own proof. And this confidence, I believe, gave Dr. Munger the ability to set people free to have their own journey of faith, not his, or not his prescription, but to have their own journey of faith. And in effect, even the genius of my heart Christ home is that when you hear the parable of his own life un uh, unfold, you get to go into your own rooms and you see different things in your rooms than he saw in his room. And uh, he doesn't say, now this is what's in your room too. He just said it was in my room. And these are things that I saw in my room. Now what do you see in your room? And I believe it's that confidence that Jesus Christ is able to be his own proof, is able to uh, authenticate himself, that set Bob Munger free to set you free. And I've tried to experience that in my own ministry as well. I owe it to him. I want to read one more quote. Uh, this is my last quote from Bob Munger here, where he says, where he explains that philosophy. He says, he says, uh, for me, that night in Victory Circle, where he said, I, I told everybody I, I believe, that night at Victory Circle, when I faced the light, see again, for the first time in my life, it was the first move in a journey of a thousand steps. That's also why in sharing the gospel, I don't try to determine whether someone has been converted. I leave that to God and allow people to say for themselves where they stand. I learned only I learned early on to let the Holy Spirit bear witness. I would say in leading a person to Christ, can you from the heart thank God that He's now forgiven you? 
And then he said, and Bob ends this with this line, and he said, you can usually tell whether it's authentic when they answer it. But it's their own journey. And Bob Munger trusted the Holy Spirit to, uh, to be the confirmer and trusted each person to have their own journey. I believe that's part of the greatness of, of Robert Boyd Munger as a teacher and also as a, uh, uh, an, an encourager. It also, it, I think, explains why he is fundamentally, in his preaching, biblical. When you're primarily biblical, then you're encouraging someone to read the text for themselves. And they get that aha moment when they see it for themselves. I love that. I, that's what I love about doing exposition. And tomorrow I get to do it in 2 Timothy. There are moments in 2 Timothy that are terribly exciting to me. But what is really exciting is when you see it before I saw it. When you have that aha moment, I see it for myself. And I think that's why Bob Bunger was mainly a biblical expositor and preacher. Uh, he was winsome and he was good in telling narratives of his own life and of others. But there was that sense of the text. You see it in my heart, Christ's home. It's a text that's coming alive uh, from Ephesians 3. Now finally, my last concept, my last uh, marker. I think the total earnestness and authenticity of his character always bless the people around him. And I think uh, the secret of his uh, ability to relate cross-culturally uh, without any condescension or defensiveness or fear comes from this authenticity of character. And, uh, and that was a blessing to people because you got what you saw. And you know, that earnestness and lack of hypocrisy and lack of, of pastors and lay people that want to show off or want to be something important to impress somebody else. That's what is so, uh, it, it, it doesn't help you communicate. It hinders communication. But when you meet someone who's real and where you, they, they are what they, what they say they are, the smile is authentic. When you meet that and see it, it, it has an amazing ability to cross over boundaries. And I think one of the reasons, as you know, Bob Munger was a great mission statesman in the, in the world church. And one of the reasons people of other nationalities and races and cultural backgrounds were able to really uh, vibe with him was because of that authenticity. Uh, because there's nothing quite as disarming as someone who just is who they are without pretense. And that was, that was this man. Now, I'm going to end. Uh, Earl Palmer Ministry publishes a newsletter. And if you go on the website, you can read our newsletter. My latest one has a picture of Robert Boyd Munger. By the way, he's, uh, I, I, I talked to Monica when I uh, wanted to do this uh, evening. And I said, Monica, do you have a good picture of your dad? I would love a great picture, not just the press release pictures. And she said, well, I'll work on it. But I didn't have time to wait for Monica to send me one. And I went through all of our albums, and I found this wonderful picture that we took ourselves of Bob Munger and his sister, Helen. And the only problem is he's leaning over toward Helen. And so he's leaning in this picture. And that's why he's leaning, because we had to cut Helen out of the picture. I, we love Helen, I'll tell you, she was like a grandmother to us. But this captures the personality of Robert Boyd Munger with the, the, but he's leaning. So I want to read what I wrote in, in this, because in this article I have John Stott's picture on the top, I had just gone to the memorial service for John Stott at Wheaton, and I wanted to mention that, and then I wanted to mention Bob Munger as well. So here's what I said about both men. John Stott and Robert Munger were both reserved, always respectful of those who they met, and therefore able to really connect with people heart to heart and mind to mind. Both had unshakable integrity of character. Both were missionary pastors at heart. Both were alert to the needs of the world. And both loved people. And that's two great heroes of our faith. Thank you, Reverend Earl Palmer. This is Dick Stoddard. We'll be back with more of the news at Earl